the Happy Families podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Later today, I'm going to pull the kids out of school at lunchtime. We're going to go camping and it's going to be me and a couple of the kids in a tent. We're probably going to get rained on and I'm okay with that. The kids are only going to do better tomorrow if I do better tomorrow. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. Hello, this is Dr. Justin Coulson. I'm the author of six books about raising happy families and the founder of happyfamilies.com.au. Here with Kylie. Hello, Kylie. Hey. My wife, mum to our six kids, always looks at me funny when I say hello because we've been talking to each other for hours and now suddenly we're here uh, recording a podcast. Hey, just before we talk about I'll Do Better Tomorrow today, uh, can I just make a really big announcement? Today's Black Friday. Black Friday is the day where the biggest sales in the world happen and at Happy Families we're doing the same thing. If there's been anything that you've been thinking about getting your hands on, today's the day. Go to happyfamilies.com.au, 25% off all of our books. That doesn't include the bundles because we already discount them, but 25% off all books. We never discount our books that much. This is a big deal. Our summits, we've done two summits, Little People, Big Feelings and Miss Connection, 30% off those summit recordings, incredible prices, uh, 50% off all other digital products and the big one, our Happy Families membership. Because a happy family doesn't just happen. Our Happy Families memberships, the only time of the year that we ever discount them and the biggest discount we'll ever give on it, 30% off the premium Happy Families membership. Black Friday sales, like I said, happyfamilies.com.au. Everything's waiting for you and it's ending today, Black Friday. So please jump on it right now, uh, happyfamilies.com.au. Okay, that's my big plug. I normally don't use the podcast for advertising at all, but it's Black Friday. So please, for those of you who don't like advertising, forgive us, but we really needed to get that out there. Uh, Kylie, I'll do better tomorrow. Um, parental guidance. We're going to have a bit of a chat about that before we dive into some conversations about what we've learned about parenting this week. We asked a bunch of our podcast listeners some questions about what lessons they took from the TV show. Jess said this. What I loved about the parents on Parental Guidance was that both parents, where there were two parents, were really aligned on what their parenting style was. In our family, we have two parents with two different parenting styles. Uh, It kind of prompted me to think that we need to be on the same page more of the time. What I loved about what the show highlighted was the acknowledgement that all of these different parenting styles have so many strengths in them. And I think sometimes we focus on the fact that we come from two totally different camps. Mm -hmm. But I think if we're a bit more strategic in our thinking and recognize that he brings strengths and I bring strengths, and how can we marry those strengths together to create this wonderful whole? Yeah, that's really nice. You know, the other thing that stood out to me as I listened to what Jess was saying, sometimes there might be some benefits to being a single parent because you don't have to (laughs) argue with anybody about, no, I I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, make too light of that. Uh, This is what uh, Larissa said. I loved it when the nature parents said that children can't climb the walls if you take them away. And that was such a good reminder that our children are actually much, much happier when they're outside. Yeah, we've implemented that and it's already been quite helpful. Nature is fuel for the soul. We see this all the time with our kids, one of them in particular, let her loose outside <laughs> yes, and totally. she is just an angel. You know what I love about Larissa's comment as well? It's just little comments, little, little statements from the parents or from me or whoever in the show. Little things stood out to everybody. I, totally forgotten that that had even been said, but what a great comment. Uh, here was uh, Miriam's family lesson based on what she saw in parental guidance. Our family could benefit from a lot more routine, especially at dinner time, but it's very hard with three children at such different ages, 14, 8 and 3, to find any kind of routine that works for us all. So we'll work on that one. (laughs) It's interesting. Miriam probably has a routine, but she doesn't see it the same way as what she's seen in a structured... Well, Brett and Tony, the routine parents, they were very, very, very structured. Yeah. But she, with, with such a huge age gap between 14, eight and three. each of them, yeah. there will be some kind of routine, but it won't be kind of meshed together necessarily. What I think is really interesting as well is just, just how much routine is a hassle. Like we, we're constantly talking about routine because routine requires so much work. Uh, but but what, a, what a really great lesson. The second question that we asked people was, which parents on parental guidance did you connect the most with? This is what Rachel said. When I was first a parent... I imagined parenting as a strict parent, as that's how I was raised. 
So the first few years were characterised by strict parenting. I gradually moved towards less authoritative parenting and more relationship building while still trying to maintain boundaries. I think from seeing the 10 sets of parents on the show, I view them a bit like a painting palette, a dab from each of them that my husband and I mix to make our own family style. We are homeschoolers, but somewhere in the middle of the six kid family homeschooling and the nature-based family. We definitely go barefoot most of the time here, but we do use workbooks. I can't have them all working at the same time as they all need one-on-one. So that's where the children who aren't being helped at the time, they end up with a lot of free range time. Wow. Uh, so so many things that we could pull out of Rachel's observations. I love her admission that she aspires to routine, but it just <laughs> never quite sticks. I think I feel a bit like that sometimes. Some mornings, There's yeah. always someone in there who's like, no, nope, no, nope, not not following that. Pretty, well, we've got two that just won't follow the routine <laughs> at all. Not, not even, you know what I like, though? Rachel's highlighted with those 10 sets of parents – there's this palette mm. that we can all paint from and we don't have to be any particular style. We, we can literally just lift these ideas. And, I mean, research shows there is actually a parenting style that matters the most, but from an entertainment perspective and from what we saw in the show, what we've really seen, and, and I've heard so many people saying the same thing, I just want a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And, and that's what's going to work best. Well, and I think when we had our family meeting last week with the kids, they highlighted that as well. They didn't see mm. us as being, you know, one type. They recognised that we pulled in, you know, different aspects from different areas. Well, that's because they didn't have our type on the show. The, <laughs> the, the perfect parents. The perfect parents were not on the show. So, therefore, uh, they didn't get to see the perfect parents parenting. I don't even know what to say to that. (laughs) Okay, it was a bit of a stretch. Let's listen to – and nobody would have connected with that, right? I mean, there is no such thing as a perfect parent. But the authoritative parenting style is actually the right one. But but that's just a mouthful. No one wants to say we're the authoritative parents uh, because you're actually holding yourself up as the gold standard. I I like the way we did it on the show. Lisa connected most with this family. I think we really like some aspects of the free-range parent. I love – the freedom of that idea of how they parent. Um, I also kind of really liked the uh, French style of parenting as well. What I've noticed in our family as we have kind of let go of the apron strings a little bit more Mm -hmm. over the years Mm -hmm. and given our children autonomy is that- Is that our oldest kids get cranky what the little kids can get away with? Yeah, there is a bit (laughs) of that, but- is just that word freedom. There, yeah. There is so much more freedom that the children feel and we feel as adults because we don't have to make all the decisions. Yeah, the, the anxiety goes down when you stop controlling. It's, it's, it's actually that simple, except that there's got to be appropriate boundaries still because otherwise anxiety is going to go up again eventually. <laughs> um, we, we need to acknowledge that. Uh, Miriam uh, connected with these parents. Funnily enough, it was both the strict and the free-range parents I connected with the most, even though they kind of seem to be polar opposites. Um, I find I constantly move between the two and I'm constantly battling the tendency to be super strict. I think it can be quite confusing at times in the moment as to what I'm actually doing. So I'm working on that. Sounds like a typical parent. I'm a bit confused. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder how much of the experiences that we have as parents flow from our own experience and our personality. You know, she, she said that, you know, she kind of She's in these moments and she wants to go one way, but she's actually leaning the other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think mean, context is everything. I, I try not to be st- too strict, but when the kids are still running around the house at nine o'clock at night, I'm going to be strict. Go to bed. Full stop. End of story. We're not, we're not going to explore, explain and empower. You're just going to go to bed. Well, I mean, maybe I will listen a little bit. And once I know that there's nothing going on, but they're just being punks. They're going to bed. Uh, This is the last one from Jess. Which parents on parental guidance did you connect with the most? I resonated most with the attachment parents. This is my style probably, although not 100% of the time. I loved the free range homeschool and nature parenting styles, um, but I don't think they would work for me personally. I dislike all bugs and spiders and dirt, (laughs) so nature isn't really my best friend. (laughs) And... Uh, And I'm a little too risk averse to go completely free range. But I think that's a good challenge for me to think about where I can relax rules uh, and where I'm possibly projecting my anxieties onto my kids. Kylie, I've had so many people say that they're having conversations about parental guidance on the sidelines of the netball court or the soccer field or uh, on their bike rides with their friends or whatever it might be that they're doing. They're they're walking around the block with their neighbours. It's created great conversations. 
I actually met a grandma the other day and she was having a little chat to me and she said, have you been watching that TV show Parental Guidance? She said, it is brilliant. Yeah. I had a little chuckle and she looked at me, she said, what are you laughing at? And I said, oh, don't tell anyone, but that's my husband. (laughs) It's his, he's on the, he's on the show. He's the parenting expert. And she had a little chuckle and she just, she talked about how it was so good for her as a grandparent. She's about to meet her two-year-old grandchild for the first time because (gasps) COVID has kept them separated. Oh, wow. And so she's loved watching the show because it's actually just highlighted to her how many different ways there are to parent your children and she wanted to make sure that she kind of is across it all so when her daughter comes she's more aware of what her daughter's doing and how she can support her it was just brilliant yeah great stuff hey after the break we're going to get on with i'll do better tomorrow it's been a long podcast so we're going to keep it really short but for those of you who are new to the podcast every friday we talk about what's worked and what hasn't how we can be more intentional as parents that's coming up in just a sec on the happy families podcast with justin and kylie it's the happy families podcast imagine a home where discipline got results without anyone having to feel bad or in trouble. The Do's and Don'ts of Discipline is a webinar to help parents set limits with love, compassion and humanity. Find it now at happyfamilies.com.au slash shop. It's the Happy Families Podcast, the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now and you're a little bit more time poor because we've talked to so many people today. (laughs) But on Fridays, we usually share things that we've reflected on during the week. Yeah, and, and it's been a really – I'm going to go first. May I go first? Is that okay if I go first? Sure. I'm going first. Uh, it's been a really rough week this week. Uh, you've, you've been around a lot and, and so have I, but uh, sometimes things just don't work out. Sometimes parenting's really, really, really hard. And uh, earlier this week, one of our kids was just being um, over the top. Like she was in her sister's face. She was in our space. She was um, – and it wasn't like she was lacking attention. It's not like she's deprived of anything. This kid has had – every opportunity and all of the attention and all that sort of stuff. But I don't know, just a really rotten, lousy, horrible, no good, hard, well, painful the truth of it is, week. The truth of it is that we've actually worked extra hard with this particular child as well. Yeah. Giving her more attention, more time. So much, so much. Anyway, uh, she was in her sister's face and it, it just got really ugly a few nights ago. And so I roused on her. And and I, I don't I don't think that I was as harsh as I might have been in the past, but I still, I gave her a really good rev. And uh, the next day I got an email from her and she said a little poem. She made it up. I just feel so much guilt that my words and actions built. I know what I did was wrong. Tried to avoid it and be strong. I'm so sorry, deep inside. Clearly guilty. My hands are tied. It was obviously all my fault. I've opened my inner vault. And then she sent another one through that said, Mum and Dad, I wonder how I became so naive and selfish. I wonder how I gave you pain instead of memories to cherish. Nothing but my own anguish. I'm so sorry for hurting you and becoming your life's blemish. I read that and I just sobbed. I thought... I, I know that she drives us crazy, but the last thing I would ever want is for one of my kids to feel like she was a blemish on my life. And uh, it's just, you know what it's actually done is it's highlighted, uh, like, like a couple of times this week I've thought, I just don't want a parent anymore. I'm so over it because it wasn't just this one. Two of her other sisters as well with all the stuff that kids just drive you up the wall with. If you've only got one or two kids – Sometimes I'm really jealous because it's like you don't have to deal with it again and again and again and again and again. It's been a really, really tough week, I thought, for me. And then I read that and I thought it's been an even tougher week for her. And and I've gone from being selfish and frustrated and annoyed at how painful these kids are to just well, heartbroken and wanting to do anything and everything that I can to repair so I'm excited for today because uh, later today I'm going to pull the kids out of school at lunchtime. We're going to go camping. We're going to have some time with no agenda, no focus, just nature. And it's going to be me and a couple of the kids in a tent. We're probably going to get rained on and I'm okay with that because the kids are only going to do better tomorrow if I do better tomorrow. I think one of the things that your experience highlights is just the acknowledgement that we often get caught up in our own heads and we can only see from our perspective. Yeah. I was sitting there literally going, I mean, I didn't say it to her, but I was thinking I'm going to stop all of her extracurricular activities. I'm so sick of doing this for her. She's so ungrateful. And then I get that. 
And it's like I did not look at it from her perspective one little bit. Well, mine is probably not as deep and meaningful as your experience, but uh, earlier in the week I was able to go to the children's uh, awards assembly. Yeah, yeah. And And we all know how I feel about those awards assemblies, which is part of the reason I wasn't there. But the other reason was that I was booked out. And so as I was sitting there uh, watching our little seven-year-old Emily, who is a bundle of energy and really struggles to sit still, I was blown away at just how still she was. And she was so attentive. And at our school, they have a gold hat system. Oh, don't get me started. For 12 months, the children need to be consistent in showing gold standard behaviour. And if they do, then at the end of the year, they have this ceremony and they're given a gold hat. I've just got to interrupt for a second and say, what does it say to all the kids that don't get one? Does it, do you think that they sit there and go, oh, next year I'm going to be so much better. I'm just going to be a much better kid because I didn't get one this year. Like I just, it, It's enough to make me want to pull the kids out of school, honestly. It makes me so, so annoyed. Well, this is the first assembly I've attended of this nature. So um, seeing, seeing what happened and looking at the fact that, you know, they gave academic awards out and, you know, kind of behaviour awards out and, um, and citizenship awards out. And there is obviously a really small cluster of students that were acknowledged. And then they were the same students that came up for their gold hats. And I looked at all of these other kids And literally, there was not a single kid sitting on that floor that wasn't in the moment being attentive. And I thought, what does it mean to have a gold standard behaviour? Because for each child, it will be different based on their own capacities, their own life experience, their own home life. Like there's just, there's so much going on in this little kid's world. Anyway, at the end of the assembly, Miss Emily came up to me and she looked at me and she said, Mummy, I didn't get a gold hat again this year. And I just grabbed her and, you know, pulled her into me and just told her how much I loved her and how grateful I was for that, the way that she conducts herself and the, the, the things, her beautiful kind heart. She has such a beautiful kind heart and she doesn't need a gold hat to know that and to feel that. And, and she gave me a big cuddle and she just said, I love you. And she walked off with a little skip in her, in her step but this idea that we have to acknowledge our kids and uh, give them, you know, this oh, false sense of, I, I don't even know what to say about it, but it just, it broke my heart as I watched all of these children sitting in that space and just, you know, the big accolades that were talked about, about how these kids are the gold standard. And and like you said, where does it leave all those other kids? It's not It's not motivating them to be better. It's actually just putting them in this little box that says, I'm not good enough. Yeah. And how damaging that is. There's there's so much more I want to say about this, but our, our time is up. I, I, I want to just highlight one thing that stood out to me. And, and, and it came from a conversation you and I had earlier in the week. You were talking about a year six experience where the teacher – ranked you in the class based on your test scores and then seated you according to those test scores. And in grade six, you scored second from the bottom of the class and that's where you sat. And you shared with me how in your 40s, now as a mum of six, sometimes you still feel like that girl who's sitting in the second last seat in the class. Literally a lifelong impact. Now I can assure you that and you know this from from my point of view, you are not sitting in the second last seat of the class. You're in the front seat as far as I'm concerned. And I'm sure that anyone who listens to the podcast and hears your insights and anyone who knows you knows that you're not a second to last student. But when we measure kids on these narrow metrics or on these metrics that really come down to who notices whether the child's doing the right thing or not, or who gives them the merit award based on who needs the pep talk or whatever, we we end up with this horrible, horrible system that leaves kids feeling like they will not be good enough and it can last a lifetime. What if everybody had a gold hat? And what if there was just a gentle reminder when we saw a kid doing the wrong thing? We just said, is that gold gold standard behaviour or whatever it is? Like, let's inspire them. Not pull them down so much more to say but what I'm going to say is lots of things to think about in today's I'll Do Better Tomorrow 
things to think about around how we engage with our own kids, how we see the world through their eyes, and what we're doing to them in terms of setting up these false economies of rewards. Uh, We really hope that today's podcast has given you food for thought and that it helps you to do things in your family that will strengthen your family, uh, whether it's parental guidance, parenting style ideas, or the stuff we've talked about and I'll do better tomorrow. Either is fine with us. We just hope that it makes a difference. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon for Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And if you'd like to pick up on all of those Black Friday sales, please visit happyfamilies.com.au. Have a great weekend.